Hello, and welcome to our webinar, A Word is Worth a Thousand Pictures. So we are very glad that you could join us today. I am Jane Hendricks. I'm the Product Marketing Manager with SEL, and with me is Mihai Vlad, who will be the main presenter today. Now, I wanted to do a bit of an introduction first. Mihai is the Vice President of Linguistic AI Strategy with SDL. He is in charge of the commercial strategy for machine translation and all of the machine learning solutions that SDL has brought and continues to bring to market. He is an entrepreneur and technologist with a deep background in data sciences, marketing, sales, business, and product development. He has deep experience in developing and selling machine learning in the cybersecurity field. And for the past 15 years, he has been building and scaling sales, designing and managing a data analytics business, bringing new technologies, and delivering complex te technical projects all over the world. Now, a fun fact is that he had his own internet service provider startup while at university. Now, before we get into the content, I just wanted to go over a little bit of the housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, and we will make this available for on-demand viewing, and we strongly encourage you to share this with your network. At the end of this webinar, we'll be doing a live Q&A, so please be sure that you're typing in your questions, and we will be taking them in the order that we get them in at the end. So please be assured if we don't get to your question in the time allotted, we'll follow up with you. So with that, and without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Mihai. Mihai? Yeah, thanks for, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction, Jane. Um, so today we'll, uh, we'll, we'll cover a few areas that uh, they are actually affecting the majority of the organizations we, we work with at STL. We wanted to, to share with you some of the, some of the lessons we've, uh, some of the lessons we've learned. So before we start, um, one of the w one of the areas that is is getting more traction in the market is the way we look at content and the the, the importance that content has throughout the life uh, life journey of a, of a customer and interacting with your business and it it touches on on various uh, various steps in in the journey whenever customers consider to buy a product whenever the customer are evaluating it even post-purchase, and all these elements uh, that are aggregated under content start to have an, an even bigger importance than before, especially in, in a digital world. And why, why is content in the point of view or from a, from a business leader point of view? Uh, they bring customers. So a really well-executed campaign with a really good content might attract more and more customers towards your business and a really good set of um, technical manuals or, let's say, in information about the products or support materials might keep your customers closer rather than get them um, to be frustrated after they, after they purchase your product or interact with your service. So uh, every time we meet with, with our prospects and customers, uh, they, see, they see content in, in this uh, in, in these two areas, like trying to get more customers, trying to keep the existing customers more, which are uh, some of the, the main, the main uh, dynamics. So if we're looking at content, let's define what content is. So content is, is ultimately a collection of, of all the materials that we create within the marketing departments, within the product departments, within technical departments, even support departments. And they could be infographics, articles, campaigns, videos, uh, YouTube channels. Even this webinar is ultimately a content for us. And the the problem we've got with content is that if you're actually trying to trace the the way this content is created and is disseminated to the users, you're going to realize that the the whole process is fragmented. If you're if you're tracing even the creation of a PowerPoint from from an idea to having delivered to a customer uh, or let's say a, a, a PDF that describes your product to be delivered to your customer in a target language at the right time, you're going to realize that this whole process is fairly fragmented. And it's interesting that we are looking at the, we, we are not looking at the 
uh, the whole global content supply chain as a supply chain. We are trying to optimize the, uh, the supply chain for creating technical components or to deliver components to our products or making sure that what we've got, uh, what, what all the elements necessary to create our products are in line. But we look at content very differently. And there is, there is uh, a thesis to be made whether we should look at the creation of content as a supply chain. So what should we optimize? Or if, if we looked at the creation or, or the, the whole content life cycle as a, as a supply chain, what are the problems that we need to address? First of all, we need to deal with uh, the explosion of volume. So people in marketing have to generate lots and lots of volume. The people that have to transform the content are bombarded by, by the sheer volume and trying to figure out how to manage budgets to transform and translate this content. And people that deliver content throughout the, throughout the campaign to figure out when to send this content to the right audience to make sure that it, it, it achieves the, the required ROI for that given content. So to, to, go, to go a bit further, the first step, it's all about creating the, the relevant content. And marketers are, are only highlighting the, the fact that it, they're literally struggling to create the most effective content. So the first step needs to be addressed. The second one is related to being able to transform this content faster. So I'll give you an example. We, we work with some customers that have their product in the market. It's ready to be launched, only to be slowed down by the very fact that it takes somewhere between 80 to 100 days to create all the content in all the languages to support that given launch. So it is actually not the product development that's slowing down the go-to-market. It is actually the whole orchestration of content uh, that is slowing down the, the release of a product. And if we're going for further, something that's probably even uh, better understood is being able to take the existing content, so the content that was created, and deliver it to the right audience at the right time. Uh, should that be achieved, the uplifting sales could be quite considerable. So if we, have, if we have these three challenges that we want to address, and they're universal, we will actually be able to, to identify them in any type of company that is running a marketing department, especially if, they, if, if the company is trying to go digital. So should we want to, to solve this problem? The big question is, like, can AI help us streamline this process? It, it's a question that every organization is asking these days. Can AI help us? And if it could, how could that look like? And could it actually help with all these, uh, with all these three challenges that we have in the global, global content supply chain? And the way to look at this is to, to go and try to understand what content is. And if we, if we break it down, like if we're looking at images and videos and audios and, and presentations, and then we're trying to look at technical documentations and even user reviews and brochures, what they tend to have in common, the, the common denominator for all these elements in order to be processed, indexed, generated, and, and utilized is nothing else other than language. Like if we're looking at, uh, at video files as an example, they get transcribed before they actually get indexed. Same thing with audio files. And everything that's, that's within the, the core information within all these documents is ultimately language. So for, in order to solve this problem, we need to look at, at building something related to language, uh, i.e. building a linguistic AI. So if we are to build a linguistic AI to solve with these three challenges, the subsequent question is, is the technology good enough today in 2019 to help us with this? Can, can AI handle the complexity of, of language as well as it could do when it comes to processing images or when it is to dealing with audio? So this is the question we've been asking at SDL. And here are some of the answers or, or how, we, how we looked at the problem. So if we step back a bit and we look at AI, so AI contains a bunch of, of let's say, a set of, of clearly defined applications. The, the, the biggest advancements are coming primarily in the field of vision, followed by, let's say, speech. Uh, robotics is picking up with, a, with the help of AI. And language has always been there as a, as a, as a section within artificial intelligence, but it has never, it, it kind of like always lagged behind vision and, and speech. So 
the, the question remains, like, how good is it in 2019? Can we actually trust? Can we actually use the state-of-the-art technology to, to solve a content challenge? So the, in order to assess this, the, a, a good way to, to figure out how good the technology is is to look at something called human parity in, in some of these stuff. So we know that AI is not as good as humans, but we can actually measure how good it gets compared to what humans do when it comes to some cognitive tasks. So the, the answer, depending on the field you're looking at, um, in 2019, is something close to 95%. And what do we mean by that? So if, if you're trying to identify images or patterns in images, if they're really clearly defined, a computer will make a five, will generate a 5% error. This is obviously not as good as a human, but in terms of parity, it's 95, maybe 96% if the images are clearly defined and you've got a really good training set. When it comes to audio, uh, the, the performance measured in word error rates, it clips to 94, 95%. It started to tail off this year, but uh, you'd expect a machine to be able to listen to, to a sentence, be that Alexa or Siri or whatnot, and then be able to transcribe that by making a 5% error rate. Now, interestingly, humans actually transcribe or will make potential of like a, a 4% error rate. So it, the technology is not that far for generic, uh, for generic listening sentences. When it comes to language, things are a bit more complicated. It, it's actually quite hard to, to figure out what the accuracy of a language task is. And I'll, I'll try to explain what that is by comparing it with, with how computers look at images, as an example. So if we, if, let's say we put our minds in the minds of a computer and, and a computer looks at, or an algorithm, or an AI algorithm looks at this image, the, the task of the algorithm is to identify what or classify what this image is. What or range from this is a woman, this is eyes, uh, this could be a surgeon, a dentist, a doctor, it could be many things. And all of them could be valid answers for this. And the way that the computers and the algorithms come up to this conclusion is by having observed lots and lots of images that were labeled with these with this words that I mentioned. So. There's a large data set of images that are labeled with the word doctor, lots of images that are labeled with the, uh, with the word woman, as an example. So uh, I'd be curious to see what, what you think of or how would you classify this image. Now, if I provide the same image from a different angle with a more context, the problem becomes much easier. So if you're looking from a different angle and you have more context, for this image, then the labeling is much easier, the classification much easier. You are dealing ultimately with a doctor. But how does a computer, or how, how does a, an image recognition algorithm handle this task? So first of all, it will identify parts of the image. It will process some uh, set of pixels and identify, ah, I am dealing with a person here. I can see a mask here. Now it could be a woman or it could be a doctor, but if I'm looking throughout the image and I actually observe the fact that there is say, more context in, in the image and I'm looking at the utensils here on the right, I'll be able to, to, to ultimately identify the fact that by, by combining the data that we've got uh, in on, the, on the left of the image with the, with the data that's on the right of the image, what we do is create context. So what do we mean by creating context? Is, is that ultimately able to correlate all this information available uh, within an image to generate a better classification? Now, luckily, when we deal with image recognition, in this particular image, we've got 40 million bytes. If we, if we count the number of pixels and we multiply by the color and so forth. So there's a lot of information for us to make a really, really good or, or to get a really good decision. But when we're asking computers to classify or to deal with a word that says doctor, a word that actually contains only six bytes, so vastly less inf or much, much less information than the 40 million bytes, the computers actually are starting to trip up a bit because they don't have enough information. They do not have enough, enough context to make the right decisions. So then 
when, when it comes to language related tasks, the problem of the problem of context becomes the, the paramount problem in, in everything that you want to process around language. And this is the, the biggest challenge that researchers are, are, are working towards. And interestingly, so what happened starting with 2017 and it got developed further in 2018 and 19 is, is kind of like a resurgence of, of a very old idea. And this idea uh, was, uh, was Warren Weaver's idea. And he, he suggested that when it comes to language tasks, in this, in this case translation, we should not look at the problem of translation or the, the processing of text as a linguistic problem, but we should look at this as a cryptographic problem. So when you're trying to understand or process or translate a text, you should not be looking at trying to identify the words, but trying to imagine that someone actually encrypted that language and your task is to decrypt it. Now, this might sound far-fetched, but this is actually what we are using today or, or what the, the state-of-the-art AI is, is. This is exactly the same approach that is being used in all the AI-related tasks applied to language. So I'll give you some examples and, and how this works. The first step is to, to try and take words and convert them into numbers. And it's not just going, going to be one number, it's going to be a large sequence of numbers, it's going to be an array of 500 or 2,000 numbers. Now, the beauty of converting words into numbers is that you are going to be able, once, this is one, once these words are encoded into numbers, you will be able to convert them or start, you're going to be able to perform mathematical operations on these matrices. Again, this might sound bizarre, but a good way to visualize what uh, how this looks like and how it helps is if we take these, these specific words and we're trying to map the relationship in between them, we're going to start to identify some very interesting properties. So let's take the word, uh, like a, a really good example is to take these pairs of words. So if we take the word man and woman, as we are talking about gender, and we're trying to plot their position in this multidimensional space defined by those by, by those matrices, by those numbers, and we're trying to collapse all those dimensions into, I think, two in this case. Surprisingly, what will happen is that if we look at the position of the word king and queen, you will be very much aligned with the position of, or with the relative position of the word man and woman. Now, obviously for us humans, this is clear that what we're doing is representing gender. But the computers or the algorithms didn't know prior to look for gender what they were able to identify by looking at lots and lots of texts is to kind of like define these similarities, these analogies, but in a, in a mathematical way. And the examples go further, and the context can be developed further. So if you go, if you go further, you're going to be able to identify patterns related to singular and plural, and you're going to see that the relationship in between kings and king, or king and kings is similar to the relationship between queen and queens. And the analogies uh, in this multidimensional space go to even further, or go further than just gender and singular and plural. You're going to be able to get um, even complex relationships, like relationships between prime ministers and countries. And it's a fascinating research field right now to identify these patterns. So, as a good example, in a, in a research paper, after you've trained the, the models or the language models with just 300 dimensions and let's say less than less than a billion words, you're going to be able to spot these patterns like Sarkozy in France, Berlusconi in Italy, Merkel in Germany, without actually training the machines to create to to create this context, without priming them to look for this pattern. And this is actually incredibly incredibly useful in all language related tasks. And it's also like one of the things that personally or fascinates me personally is that if if you're actually able to if you're able to identify these words in a multidimensional space and they are numbers, it means you can operate on those numbers to correct some of the quirks or some of the some of the biases that we might be able to identify in language. So a very good example is to is to go back to the original to the original image or the original word that we were looking at and, and try to plot this in this space against men and women, king and queen. So if we were to ask 
I were to ask you to, if, if you were looking at the vertical line being ultimately the, the gender line, and on the left of it you've got the man, and on the right of it you've got woman, the question would be, where would you put the word doctor? Now, depending on, you know, on, on where you live, in, in theory, the word doctor should be right in the middle. It should not be, uh, it, it should not be biased at all, but because in our society and because in the language that we train these models are, uh, are kind of like we're, we're starting to see these correlations, unfortunately, the word doctor is more correlating with the word man. And this is probably one of the, this is more like a gender bias that is, is kind of like coming out from the training data. There could be furthermore biases that are that we're going to be able to observe in this data, and ultimately the data doesn't lie. But at the same time, we're able to correct these things. And what you could do, or, or some operations that you can do, is to actually plot or to debias the word doctor and position it right in the middle and between men and women. So these are kind of like the, the cool operations and the, something that uh, provides more flexibility to algorithms than before uh, by ultimately being able to look at, at all these elements as, as a mathematical and as, as a cryptographic problem. So back to our, back to our webinar. Uh, it is indeed super interesting that just one word could be equal to maybe a thousand pictures or maybe to 40 billion or, or 40 million pixels. And we are able in 2019 to operate, uh, operate con or generate context from these words by observing many, many words and converting them into numbers. That's kind of the secret behind uh, everything that's happening in, in language and AI in 2019. And a very good application, just to, to get a sense of how this works, is if we take all this, all this innovation and we apply it to a really well understood application, which is, say, automated translation or machine translation, if we apply the same thing, uh, all of a sudden, the problem of translation does, is, is not becoming a linguistic problem, but it becomes a mathematical problem. So if you're curious to understand how, how a machine, how a uh, 2019 generation machine translation system operates, it ultimately takes all those words that you've seen, converts them into numbers, starts to multiply the representation, generate a meaning vector right in the middle, and then one word after one word after one word is going to be able to generate another sentence. Ultimately, it encodes the sentence into numbers, it converts into a meaning vector, and then it starts to generate the translated sentence. It sounds complete science fiction, but this is, this is the, the, the best quality of translation that you're going to be able to get in production system is going to come from this type of, from this type of architecture. And just to get a sense of how good or maybe how bad the, the technology is. Um, I'm not sure if you speak Japanese, but it's enough to to actually look at the translation. You're going to start to be able to 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 generate perfectly fluid translations with with very very good accuracy. And in this case, we have a we have a an, an even an even longer segment that we're able to translate. So this is possible because of all these correlations and because we're able to, by, by actually aggregating or converting all these words into numbers, the position of the words is not becoming problematic as it used to be in the past. All of a sudden, the translations become more fluent. So you've seen an example of, uh, of an application that is using linguistic AI. If we are to, to go back to our, to our original thesis is if we are to go further and really solve our three problems of workload, generating more content, and being able to deliver it more effectively, how would this linguistic AI look? Okay, so we know. Okay, so we know. So what else should it do? Well, if we are to dissect the problem and, and go further into what we want an AI to do to help us, first of all, it should help us better understand the content we already have. So we would like to, instead of regenerating the same content, it would be great to know what we've got in our SharePoints or within our laptops and, and truly be able to, to actually reuse it rather than recreating it from scratch. If the AI would be able to help us generate either derivatives or even content from scratch, that will also remove a, a lot of workload from, from our plate. And going further, if we are able to to ask the AI to 
to help us transform the content. Translation could be one transformation. It could be summarizing the content. It could be transforming it with a different style. Maybe we have a technical document, and it would be great if we actually make it sound less formal than a technical document. So all these all these elements might, might sound not far-fetched, but might sound science fiction. But if you're actually starting to deconstruct the problem and build the, the underlying building blocks, you might be able to to achieve part or, or to be able to solve part of this problem. So at SDL, we, we, we are developing such a linguistic AI. And these are the, the underlying blocks that we, uh, we are basing all this technology on. And all these are core technologies that are used in, in our products. And we are all obviously adapting them to the challenges of our customers. And obviously, we're more than happy to, to work with you, but should you wish to develop it yourself? So if you, if you have an R&D team uh, and, or you want to use APIs of, you know, free APIs that are available on, on various platforms, I highly, highly recommend you try and see what the technology can do. And if you are curious, uh, we're more than happy. Well, what I want to do is, and I'll share with you some of the lessons learned by building such a, such a linguistic AI. And we call this linguistic AI, right? this is the, the name of our, our infrastructure and the name of our platform. And we'll share in, uh, in a few moments and, and maybe in later webinars, what are the actual applications of this. But before applications, here is what we've learned over the past years of, of building this. So first of all, is it, it's something that you, sooner or later you, you will realize uh, once you're starting to build these these models or you're trying to to play with the generic technology is that the the generic technology doesn't approximate well on your content so what what do we mean by that like every organization has a specific tone of voice it has a specific terminology a specific vocabulary and a generic system or or let's say a generic api or or technology whatever it is even if it's summarization or translation or whatnot will be there or thereabouts when it comes to, to generic data. But if you truly want it to help your business problem or operate really well on your content, you will have to, to adapt the model or to adapt the AI technology to your content. Why, why, why should you do that? It's because in 2019 systems or generic systems cannot approximate well on all the types of content. And I'll give you an example. Even if you take a... Let's take a translator as an example. A specific translator could be really good in translating technical documents, but if you ask the same translator to be fluent and proficient in legalese, or maybe in, in pharma or in life sciences type of, uh, type of content, they might not be as effective, or they might start to look for words that they do not understand. The same thing applies to all these AI or linguistic AI technologies. They are as good as the, train, as the data you train them. And a really good example is, um, if you're looking at machine translation as an example of, of such a linguistic AI application, the generic quality has increased by quite a lot, 30%, then an extra 25% in, in the last year. But if you are able to adapt it to your own domain and your own content, you get an extra 15% list. It's actually impressive if, if you're able to get a technology that performs better by 15% just by adapting it to the content, you will have actually a competitive edge versus your competitors that are just using the, the, generic, uh, the generic technology if they are using it at all. So the, the, the first lesson for us is that all that leads to, all that leads to these improvements is the data you've got. And data is much, much more important than the actual algorithms because it is able to help our competitors. And a, and a really good way to, to approximate this is, um, is to look at Andrew So he was heading up Google Brain and Baidu. Um, and uh, right now, he's, uh, I think he was one of the founders in Coursera. He actually states really clearly that in order to generate a competitive edge, what you've got to have if you decide to, to play in the AI field is either acquire the talent or work with companies that have the talent to adapt the technology to your problem and make sure that the data set that, that, you, that you've got is clean, you're building it, you're protecting it, and so forth. 
And ultimately, data will be a, a competitive asset in, a, in an AI-driven economy because that's ultimately the fuel of all this technology. AI, linguistic AI, do not, does not learn by, you know, by, by writing more rules into the algorithm, but it just starts to approximate better and better the data you provide it to, which leads us to like the, the other lesson is we're, we're seeing companies who are so so um, say so easy or, or they treat their own data and they ultimately just squander the data by either not protecting it or by pushing it through public or to once they will be realizing, when these companies realize that the, the competitive edge is ultimately the data that they have, I think we'll be thinking very differently about using public systems to process this data. So imagine how much effort we put in the industry to protect our IP and we write patents uh, and we, we want to hide the secrets that we've got. But at the same time, when we're looking at the data which actually can make this technology better, we just squander it and we don't care about it. And we, we predict that there's going to be a shift in the next year or two, and whereby companies will actually not, will, will not relinquish the data or will not provide free access or free reign to, to their internal data because they will know this is their, their secret. So if you're a manufacturing company, as an example, and you have unique data by monitoring your systems on what produces a better, a better product, probably you wouldn't want to give that data away. The same thing applies to content. Maybe you know what resonates with your customers better. You probably wouldn't want to give that data away just to share it with a wider community to ultimately lose your competitive advantage. So otherwise, if data becomes uh, a competitive edge, technologies actually have a, have a bit of a challenge because we, we, we would like to improve the technology, and to do that, we need access to more data. But companies will not want to share the data going forward. So it's a bit of a puzzle to solve. It's like we want access to data, but companies do not want to share the data or will not want to share the data. And the only way to solve this puzzle uh, or this situation is ultimately build a technology or work with companies that are able to, to have a dual deployment system. So something that can be deployed behind the firewall within your premises and making sure that uh, that system is allowed to touch sensitive data and the data doesn't leave your secure cloud or, or premises. And then what gets processed in the cloud to benefit from cloud computing costs is ultimately something that is non-sensitive data or derived data or encrypted data. So we, we strongly believe that this is ultimately a, a, a strong, a, a really big lesson for us. And when we're building technology and products, we are strongly believing in this edge slash cloud um, uh, architecture whereby you provide them a, a technology or you play with, with a technology that is highly secure, that operates with a, with a highly sensitive data, and what gets processed into the cloud is probably less sensitive data or derived, uh, derived models after they, they are trained on-prem. The other lesson is, and, and we've seen this primarily in the, in the field of even of translation. So let's say if, if, if we're looking throughout the history of, of the, the accuracy or the quality improvements in machine translation, we, we have seen plateaus, but ultimately since 2016, 17, the quality has increased. And these are not precise metrics, but let's, let's assume that what we got in 2000 and, I don't know, 2010 was a, an accuracy of roughly 50% or a quality threshold of 50% when it comes to human parity. In 2016, maybe the previous technology led us to, to 70%. And when it comes to where the state of the art of, of the technologies today, maybe for translations, for, the, for but we've seen some examples before, but examples before. quality uh, or the, let's say the, the accuracy of the translation on generic text we can get to maybe 90, 95% depending on the languages. And it's, it's such an interesting uh, challenge that we're seeing in the market. It's like if, if you are working in any field and you've seen a technology that is improving and it's getting better and better and get better, even close to perfection, most probably you will actually use 
this technology before arriving to, I don't know, 100% parity or one-to-one parity. We probably wouldn't want to whilst we understand that maybe there is a threshold by, by where the technology is not good enough and the ROI for your business might be negative, we are definitely in the positive ROI field right now. So with the technology improvement, even if the technology is not 100% accurate with what it does and you will find errors in it and you sometimes you might, you will not be precisely deterministic in what it does when it processing language, you will laugh at some results and you will say, ah, that machine, the, this, I would have translated it differently or I would have summarized things differently or I would have extracted different keywords than what the machine has done. But the bottom line, the, the point I'm trying to make is that there is so much untapped business value that by just waiting for perfection or, or waiting for, for, for reaching 100% accuracy, you would have just left untapped ROI for your competitors to to actually extract. So, so this is actually a very important lesson for us is, is making sure that every time when you're looking at the technology, there is a, a clear line of sight of the ROI. So if you were to apply a technology like this, will your content get a better ROI? If you were to generate your content 50% faster, would you see better sales? If you are translating all your content in 50 languages at one click, will your business grow or will it uh, will, will it shrink? And it, it, it's very interesting right now. We're definitely seeing a shift with the customers that we're working with in 2019 uh, that, that more and more ROI becomes, uh, becomes the, uh, the, the topic of discussion as opposed to how perfect the technology is. So the other lesson that we've learned is uh, it's somewhat linked to parity. And I'll just give an example to, to illustrate the point. So if you are taking... Uh, a task. This is a vision task, not a linguistic task. And this task is to to look at a to look at a, a scan, let's say a lung scan, and try to identify whether it has, uh, let's say, malignant patterns within within it. Whether we can spot any malformations or anything like that. Now, a professional radiologist, by looking at these images, will have an accuracy or a precision of 96.6 percent. So. Out of 100 images, he will miss mislabel. He or she will mislabel. Let's say four out of a four out of 100. This is actually quite a quite a good accuracy after years and years of years of years and years of training. If we take an AI system or, or an image recognition system, the accuracy of this system of identifying those malignant patterns or or anomalies is only 92%. So you could say it's twice as bad because it generates twice as much error than, than, than the human. So then the obvious conclusion will be we cannot use this machine. This machine is pointless. It just, just generates, it generates twice as much error as a radiologist. Ignore the technology. But interestingly, if you actually combine the results of this AI algorithm with an oversight or with an overview from a radiologist or a professionally trained radiologist, the accuracy or the combined accuracy is 99.5%. So all of a sudden, you're actually reducing the, the error rate by, I don't know, a factor of three or four. So this is actually impressive because by actually combining these technologies, not only do you process things faster, but you're reducing a lot this, you're, you're reducing a lot the, the error rate. And this this type of this type of, of learning or what, what we've realized in all linguistic tasks that, that we are working on. So even if you take, a, as an example, a, a translation task, yes, a human translator will be much better than, than a machine translation output. But if you actually combine forces and you design a system in such a way that, uh, that is able to provide either faster throughput or reduces the, the repetitive work, it ultimately generates a lot of ROI for all the, or even for the language related tasks. So the lesson learned for us was that it doesn't matter whether the human is better than machine or the machine is better than human. By combining forces, you can actually generate a net plus value uh, as opposed to just getting them to compete uh, against each other. So other ways of, of doing this, instead of dogmatically going after perfect full automation, 
there is much more value to be extracted by intelligently providing assisting or assistive technologies to all the linguistic tasks. So do not expect a machine that will, in 2019, will generate perfect text for you not to have to write your, your PDFs or, or your PowerPoint. This is not going to happen in 2019. It might happen in, in, in the near future. But there are good enough technologies that are going to be able to allow you to faster generate content by providing assistive technology. And these, these are some of the, the things we're working on. And once we realize that with this fundamental, this fundamental observation, like we, we, we took on the challenge, uh, so this is something we, we've done last year, we took on the challenge to take an existing problem and see how AI can help. So in this case, it was a, a content generation problem to help marketers generate content much faster. So if you remember challenge number one, and instead of just focusing on purely generating content, we 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 rethought the problem or of breaking it down and solved the problem content that is at hand and then being able to provide assistive technologies to to help generate content much faster. So this is also another another very important paradigm is is not obsessively focusing on on the best state of the art core technology, but combining these technologies in such a way that it solves the, the initial problem that, that you are trying to solve. So it, it, as a good example, so our linguistic AI stack contains know, more than 10 core technologies, but we are very carefully combining them, all of them into our product set. So our machine translation product is an example. It doesn't make use only of machine translation, but a language model or the language identifier content is playing into the playing into machine translation. The same thing for other products that we are building, like TMSs and content assistance for marketers. There are probably the whole suite of technology that we get adapted to adapt to this machine. machine. We can, the ultimate lesson or the last lesson for us was AI in itself will not solve the problem or the challenges. It will actually be products and carefully thinking about the challenge at hand and combining these technologies to truly solve the initial problem. So use cases and clearly defined use cases are, are incredibly important. So in, in closing, just to summarize some of the lessons we've learned is data will be so much more important than the actual algorithms. Being able to adapt the technology to your domain, whatever linguistic domain, whatever domain you are, Ultimately, we should be asking on how you can adapt or further customize the technology to better approximate or predict your type of language or your type of content. Making sure you do not squander data is such a such a paramount thing. It's, it's like, as I said, like we spend so much money in in protecting uh, protecting IP, we should be treating data exactly the same way and ask. So that every time when we do processing or retrain models or, or linguistic AI models, so that this training actually happens in a, in a secure environment with a tight control of the data, which is your data. Furthermore, a uh, combination of human and machine is much better than the others. And looking very differently at problems, as, as in this case as predictions, will actually, will actually help you unlock or, or leverage at maximum what AI can do. So, if if we look back, like what the internet age has brought us is ultimately a reduction in the cost of connectivity. The transistor or the integrated circuit has helped us do is to reduce the cost of computation. What AI is bringing is ultimately a, a, a massive cost reduction in being able to make predictions. And if, if you're able to reframe problems in terms of predictions, you will be able to extract or maximize the, uh, maximize the, 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 the leverage of what AI can bring. And in closing, as I said right from, from the beginning, we, we, ha we are on this journey on, on developing our linguistic AI stack, and we are already making it available into the majority of, uh, into the majority of our pro pro uh, products and we want to make sure that we're further developing this. And if you are interested to find out more or reach out on some of the lessons learned on how you can use these technologies or uh, on, on how you can, you can actually apply it within your, your content challenges, we'd be more than happy to, to help you with it. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to John.
That was a, a fantastic presentation, and uh, I want to make sure that folks are submitting their questions. We have a couple in already. Now, before we get to the Q&A, I just wanted to let the folks here know, Mihai and I are going to be at the AI Summit in London. Um, it's right around the corner in June. So if you're there um, or planning on being there, please do stop by. We would love to meet you and uh, chat with you. Please do make sure that you're visiting our web pages for machine translation on SDL.com and following us on social media. We really want to make sure to keep these conversations going and make sure that the latest SDL innovations. So, um, Mihai, we have some really good questions. So I'm going to kind of go through them one by one. And I'm going to start with um, how would an accent be handled? This is kind of specific. If you're using linguistic AI to uh, work with voice, right, to do some voice integration, et cetera, how does that, how does that handle the language nuances? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. So we, we uh, just for transparency, what, what we focus on at SDL is, is primarily text. This is our bread and butter, what we've done uh, for the past 17 years. But we partner with some, some really strong uh, with some really strong providers when it comes to speech recognition. Uh, one of the, the the common wisdom of us up until a few months ago was that you would have to train a specific model for, let's say, every dialect, as an example. And what's happening, I know the, the latest research of, of the last few months is that if you actually combine all the dialects into into one model. So as an example, I don't know if you, you might take like closer dialects, like maybe in, in Arabic, and you pile them all together into one model. So instead of just having a one-to-one -one training, you're actually combining more of the data with multiple dialects. The results are actually better than just focusing on, um, on one single, on one specific dialect. So in other words, instead of just building many, many, many models for each and every dialect, Right now, the, the the research is showing that by combining all these dialects together, might you might actually be able to to get better results. Otherwise, if if you have to deal with special dialects, you will probably employ language identification first, and then trigger the right model to to deal with this. So hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. Um, so another one is, uh, what is uh, really the difference between machine learning, machine translation, and linguistic AI? How does that kind of fit together? Oh, very, very good question, very good question. So um, if we're looking at AI, so what, what is AI? This is kind of like the, the overarching umbrella. AI is our, let's say, human ambition to do, to get computers to perform cognitive tasks or what we deem or what we say the cognitive tasks. Uh, as an example, if you, if you, sit in a car and you're looking at the at the red light and you immediately want to press the brake, for AI point of view, this is considered a cognitive task. You look at the red light, you press the brake, you swerve away from the danger. So this whole field uh, of AI is, is related to self-driving vehicles and it combines vision. So as an example, image recognition is a big field of AI with, uh, with robotics and navigation. Another field of AI is searching and planning, so being able to plot a, plot a path uh, or the, the most effective path. Another application of AI is to convert into theory you should be able to, to write down what I'm saying. So this is also like speech recognition or text-to-speech or speech-to-text is an, an AI application. Machine translation or automated translation is one of those applications. One one of the one of the things we'd like computers to do really, really well. And it started in nineteen forty nine and it it evolved. But ultimately think of machine translation as an application. Like it, it strangely enough it is considered an AI complete problem. So if we are ever able to achieve perfect machine translation, uh, it is said that we would have achieved AI complete would have solved many, many problems uh, within AI. We would have understood reasoning, um, generation, modeling, meaning, et cetera, et cetera. Now, machine learning 
is machine learning is ultimately a method by which you train these algorithms to get smarter and smarter and smarter. You don't need to use it. You can actually program. Uh, you, you can get a bunch of really smart researchers and linguists and, and get them to come up with all the rules that define a language or a translation or come up with summarization. Or you can, you can ask the algorithm to observe pre-trained data and learn from it without explicitly telling the algorithm how it does. So even if, if you have a child and, and, and you, you ask the child to, or you want the child to learn to play football, most probably you're not going to drill into their head the rules of football and what they could do. They will just observe other people playing and then they will understand that they need to put the ball through the net and uh, the ball through the net and, and that's about it. This is, this is the same way as algorithms can learn and can derive these, these rules by observing prior data. And this is called machine learning because the machine learns from pre-existing data. Uh, and then this is, uh, there's a, a specialized field in machine learning called deep learning. And the way it works is that it, it uses some very complex structures of, of nodes stacked on top of each other, which are very deep. So there are many, many layers. And this tends to approximate really well uh, the, 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 let's say, the task you're giving. And linguistic AI is what we, is, is, a, is an area within AI that deals with all the language tasks. So some of them that I, that I mentioned here is what we call linguistic AI. So hopefully this answers the, the question. Yep, absolutely. That's great. Um, and I think we have time for maybe one or two more. So uh, if anybody has questions left over, we'll follow up with you. But this one's quite good. So our, is, uh, the question is, is SDL the only CMS translation vendor that's offering linguistic AI? And uh, if not, is there anyone that you know that's actually doing this and what makes high different, what makes high unique? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. So uh, before I jump into the question, uh, I just want to, to go back to the previous one. Um, the, the reason I like the previous question is this is a, just because machine translation and machine learning, use the word machine in them, uh, one, let's say machine learning is the method by which you train the algorithm and machine translation is the actual application. You can call it machine speech to text. So it's, it's kind of like a common, like we, we've done a really poor job of, of naming these technologies. But back to, to the question at hand, so are we the, the only vendor that, uh, that has a CMS less, uh, less translation technology? So I think there are many, many, us as FDL, we, we, have a, we have a CMS. There are many, many other CMSs. Our, our CMS, which is called Tribune, is primarily focused on customers want to go global faster. So if, you, if you're a multinational organization and you understand the impact of globalization and understand the complexity or you're, you're uh, say, suffering from having to manage so many content components into so many languages, we are actually perfectly designed for or specifically designed to handle this challenge. Uh, so that's that's what's specific about uh, Trident site. Trident Docs is is another component that helps you break down the content. So we're very very well focused on on what we're doing with the CMS. When it comes to linguistic AI, we don't know of, of other. So there are generic APIs which you can find uh, online. So you can go to there's a Google stack, there is a an AWS stack, there's a Microsoft stack. You can find summarization APIs. You can find uh, named entity recognition. The challenge or, or the reason we decided to build our own technology was not hubris. It was a, a really clear business problem. So our customers said that they can't utilize the generic APIs. They don't know how to customize them to the problem they've got. And this doesn't apply to translation. It applies to many, many things. Secondly, they didn't want to share the data in the cloud. They were very adamant that all the processing should happen or, or, or when it deals with sensitive, when they wanted to deal with sensitive data, they want to push it through the cloud. Thirdly, and I'm pretty sure you realize that you have a big data and you want to monetize it or extract data from this and you push it through the cloud, all of a sudden the costs are gonna to start to, to increase 
quite radically. So in, in some instances, it might be better to actually run your own technology on your own servers to, to reduce the cost. So that's why we, we offer a dual, dual stack. So it's something you can run on the edge uh, much more cost effectively and much more easier, e easier in the cloud. And last but not least, um, I think the biggest, the biggest differentiator for, for high is that we employ a SDL something close to, I don't know, maybe more than 2,000 linguists. Uh, the, the amount of knowledge uh, the company has when it comes to complex linguistic tasks, the, the best you can find in the industry. And we've been building machine, machine let's say machine translation stack and machine learning uh, capabilities for the past 17 years. It's only natural for us to to further evolve this. And yeah, it's it's an incredibly exciting exciting field. And I think that the message would be whatever you choose to, to go, just start using it. There is so much untapped potential within the content you've got that even even just scratching the surface, I'm pretty sure will give you ideas on how to how to generate a competitive edge.